Um, and it is also my pleasure, I will introduce at the same time our second speaker today, Jeff Quilly. Jeff Quilly is a professor of art history at the University of Sussex. His research focuses on British art and the maritime imperial nation in the long 18th century on which he has published widely. He was previously curator of fine art at the National Maritime Museum, where he curated the exhibition William Hodges, The Art of Exploration, and Art for the Nation, um, the oil paintings collections of the National Maritime Museum. His monograph, Empire to Nation, Art History and the Visualization of Maritime Britain was published by Yale University Press in 2011, and we are all very much looking forward to his next book, um, the monograph British Art and the East India Company, which is due for publication later this year. Okay, morning everybody, and likewise thank you very much to Kate and Nika for the invitation to speak today and to be part of this really extraordinarily interesting conference. Um, I'm not going to be talking about an art institution. I'm not really going to be talking about the Atlantic world either. So um, there we go. But hopefully it will, what I've got to say, will have some bearing and um, invite us to reflect around the relationship of imagery to institutions and place. One of the most reproduced British artworks made in connection with the East India Company at the height of the English East India Company, at the height of its commercial and military power across Britain and Asia, is Spiridione Roma's allegory, Britannia Receiving the Riches of the East, up here on the screen, painted for East India House in Leadenhall Street in the City of London in 1778. It's an overworked image from the perspective of traditional art history, based on values of connoisseurship and quality, for example. The recurrent turn to Roma's painting by historians is curious. It's by a virtually unknown artist, and it's clumsily executed. Yet from a purely historical perspective, within the context of the history of empire, trade, and overseas expansion, it's an extraordinarily rich and salient image. It thus points to the issue of how to bridge the gulf that has traditionally persisted between the discipline of art history, on the one hand, and those of imperial, economic, and maritime history, on the other, which I've been laboring with for a long time. It's also an image about race. The visualization of a dark-skinned, deferential, and supposedly inferior non-Western world offering up its wealth to the white Western queen or noblewoman is familiar from portraits such as, um, da -da 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 -da. Oh, where we go, uh, such as um, Minas of Louise de Carroel here. It's a very familiar image to everybody here. But Roma's allegory has also an institutional core in being placed at the operational heart of the company's headquarters that from the early 19th century also housed the company museum, although I'm not going to have time to talk about the museum today. We can pick it up in discussion afterwards, maybe. It therefore both inscribes and discloses the issue of race at the heart of the company's identity and practice and how this had to be negotiated as an inevitable factor in the encounter of overseas commercial empire. What I want to explore here, then, is the relation of this exchange across race in relation to the physical place of the East India Company, simultaneously in the heart of the City of London, but doing business overseas in actual and imagined geographical spaces, and to think about what the implications of that might be for our conventional understanding of British art history in the 18th and 19th centuries. Roma's painting was produced at a moment of pivotal shift in the company's history, from it being a primarily maritime trading organization, shipping textiles, spices, tea, and other luxury commodities for the consumer market of the Western world, to becoming an increasingly territorial and governmental power over rapidly, rapidly expanding areas of India. It complemented George Lambert's and Samuel Scott's set of views of factories or bases, um, of company factories or bases around the world, made in 1731 as part of a decorative scheme for the courtroom of the newly built East India House, alongside John Michael Reisbrack's marble chimney piece of um, the Britannia receiving, the, receiving the, the riches of the East as well, the same subject as Roma's, to which Roma's ceiling painting undoubtedly refers. Roma's painting was placed in an equally important location within the company headquarters, in the ceiling of the Revenue Committee Room, where its allegorical relation to the material processes of making money through the rapid expansion of global commercial empire would be most powerfully understood. In this regard, moreover, it alludes to the company's growing reputation at this time in the third quarter of the 18th century as the scandal of empire. 
beset by accusations of corruption, directed particularly at its military and commercial leader, Robert Clive, who had enriched himself massively through his campaigns and deals establishing company power across Bengal, above all through his so-called coup of 1757 following the Battle of Plassey, which installed Mir Jafar as a puppet ruler of Bengal and delivered to the company four million pounds of Bengal revenues and presents, in Clive's own words. Against a series of major scandals in the 1760s and 70s, including besides the issue of Clive's personal emoluments, the horror of the Bengal famine, the company's dubious dealings with the Nawab of Arcot, and growing accusations against the Governor General Warren Hastings, Roma's painting stood, in Natasha Eaton's words, to deflect the metropolitan glare of bad publicity. Against this fraught historical backdrop, I'll just go back to Roma's painting, Roma's representa representation of the intercultural dynamic concentrated in the company's growing presence in India visualizes this as the provision of apparently unlimited material wealth proffered on a massive platter by an exotic and alluring young India to a superior figure of Britannia. The latter is clearly senior both in position and in years. Already South Asia is conceived as a developing world in comparison to the mature West and helps herself to an extravagant string of pearls from the overflowing bounty before her. A contemporary account in the Gentleman's Magazine emphasized approvingly the way the painting epitomized the company's profitable expansion of commerce across Southeast Asia to the benefit of the nation. Its detailed account provides a reading of the painting as a complete allegory of the company, from its early history up to its modern dominance of the various countries of Asia, with Britannia presiding over all and both signifying the firmness and stability of the empire and also acting as guardian and protectress of the company. Meanwhile, the genius of the Ganges pours his whole stream towards Britannia and the various provinces of Asia under the conduct of Mer Mercury, the god of merchandise, are shown eagerly pressing to deposit their different produce and manufactures before the throne of Britannia. Finally, the company's ship in the distance is laden with the treasure of the East, an emblem of that commerce from which both Britain and the company derive great and singular advantages. This contemporary reading of the painting understands it as showing the company at the centre of the wider imperial sphere and accruing great and singular advantages to both itself as a merchant corporation and to the nation at large. Yet given its importance, Roma is a surprising choice as a uh, virtually unknown artist who was not an academician or associated with the Royal Academy or any other art institution. And this surprising choice uh, was supported at the time by the acerbic comment, or the surprise of this choice was supported by the acerbic comment of Roma's contemporary Edward Edwards, that Roma, whose chief abilities and employment consisted in cleaning pictures, had, by some interest, obtained a commission to paint the ceiling at East India House, a work too feeble to confer any credit either on the artist or his employers. Another account remarked that the work was obtained by the patronage of his friend Mr Wheeler. In other words, Roma gained the commission through his connections rather than artistic merit. And the connections that counted here were not within the Royal Academy and the growing art world around St Martin's Lane and the Strand, but within the company and the City of London. It suggests that the company's imperial and intercultural identity also required a pictorial approach not catered for by academic precepts as such, and which needed to address the delicate position of the company both in the heart of London but active overseas, both British but also somehow foreign and other. Roma's final composition was significantly changed from his initial proposed design, which shows a pair of British merchants overseeing Indian labourers taking goods to two, two East India Company ships, to something more clearly emulative of Reisbrack's chimney piece. However, there was a further model for Roma's final painting, which perhaps also offers a further reason for the radical change from the first proposal. For the final composition bears more than a marked resemblance to the central grouping of Robert Taylor's pediment sculpture for the Mansion House in the, of the mid-1740s. Um, such a reference is not unlikely, since Taylor's elaborate pediment was conceived very deliberately as an allegory of the city and its commercial preeminence as beneficial to the nation as a whole. A print promoting the design and the wider significance of the mansion house itself described in detail the purpose of the iconography, which was to exhibit London triumphant, not in military achievements, but in a necessary, necessary and social arts of trade and commerce. And it goes on to describe the female personification of London at the centre here, uh, holding the Praetorian wand, a proper emblem of liberty, and bearing the cap of liberty on her sword to denote the great privileges and immunities conveyed with the freedom of this city. 
And so we have the same idea of um, a, a female personification of the world, the globe, really, or the wider, the wider world and, and country, bringing its riches to London um, in the centre in the same sort of format. There is plenty in this description which, with which the company would identify, not least the sentiments on trade and London's commercial superiority making the city the chief emporium in the universe. The company could point to its own commercial superiority as the overwhelming justification for such a claim. In view of the decisive militarism undergirding the company's expansion of power in India that had been under intense criticism since the 1765 assumption of the Diwani, leading to the Regulating Act of 1773, the company would doubtless have, have also welcomed the displaced emphasis on London triumphant not in military achievements but in the necessary and social arts of trade and commerce, inviting a similar stress on its own trade and commerce. Having recently been subjected to ongoing parliamentary scrutiny through the 1773 Act, the description of the great privileges and immunities conveyed with the freedom of the city would doubtless also have appealed to the company, intent as it was on maintaining its commercial independence from state control as far as possible. Finally, in aligning itself with London, the company might assert the independence of its own directors and employees as motivated by duty, industry and love towards the company and thence to the city more widely, the city of London that is, in other words to the distinctive and privileged commercial centre above anything else. The echoes and associations between Roma's painting ceiling panel and Taylor's pediment sculpture are powerful therefore. But the mansion house provided a convenient model for the company's self-image in other ways too. Proposed initially as the home of the Lord Mayor of London following the Great Fire of London and the restoration of the monarchy in the 1660s, after which the city saw itself as a necessary check to excessive royal authority, building work was only finally undertaken in the 1730s and the mansion house as built continued to be a potent symbol of city liberties throughout the 18th century. The Mansion House's construction didn't only mark the growth of the city's financial power and independence. It was part of a major phase of building projects within the city of a highly visible, assertive modernisation that presented a new public face for the commercial centre. In the years around 1730, a cluster of major building works in close proximity included East India House, designed by the merchant Theodore Jacobson and built between 1726 and 1729, the purpose-built Bank of England, 1732 to 34, and the Mansion House itself, on which construction work finally commenced in 1739. The company appears to have initiated this spate of new and prestigious buildings for the heart of London's commercial quarters. Now the reasons for rebuilding the company's offices at this time were not just the growth and consequent spatial needs of the company, but to create, in Mildred Archer's words, as it became rich, expanding its great business and fanning out over the Orient, almost ostensibly a public image of itself. Historians have frequently noticed also the similarity between the growth of charitable organisations in the 18th century and the development of merchant companies, not least in their largely common organisational structures. And the most striking correspondence between a mercantile company and a charity, with regard to patronage and display of images, is of course between the East India Company offices in Leadenhall Street from 1726 to 32, and the later construction of the Foundling Hospital from 1740, the aim of which was a fusion of Christian benevolence with patriotic and mercantile zeal, by which destitute foundlings would be rescued from neglect and death on the streets. Besides its humanitarian value, this would provide the children to be brought up as fodder for the military, particularly the navy, at a time when war with Spain had just broken out and the population was in decline. The Foundling Hospital has also been conventionally been taken as a foundational institution in the re-establishment of British art in the 18th century, through its unprecedented use of the public exhibition of painting and sculpture to promote its charitable aims. In the de decorative program begun in 1746 with the general courtroom and centre particularly around Hogarth's works, history paintings themed around the finding of Moses directly associated the purpose of the hospital with scripturally sanctioned mercy and deliverance. A complementary iconography was presented in Reisbrack's allegorical relief of charity for the chimney piece in the general courtroom here. Featuring where the, prominent, where the personification of charity bridges a scene of agriculture and a harbour side featuring a prominent ship's stern, balancing domestic agrarian industry with external commercial expansion. The hospital's promotional methods were thus strikingly similar to those adopted by the company a decade or so earlier. Like the hospital, the most important room, the director's courtroom at, the, at East India House, received the most prestigious and immediate decoration. 
Its principal feature, similarly, was a carved trim chimney piece supporting Risebrack's relief, depicting Britannia um, receiving the riches of the East, shown here alongside the, um, his, carve, his chimney piece for the founding hospital. Like his corresponding chimney piece at the hospital, it emphasizes shipping in the background, focusing on an iconic female figure, and bears more than a passing resemblance to the later iconography of the mansion house pediment and Roma's ceiling painting. There is then a series of links between the refurbishment of East India House and the building of the founding hospital. Similarly, philanthropy generally in the middle decades of the century became increasingly mercantile and city-based, that saw not only a remarkable flowering of charitable activity, but the emergence of a fairly well-defined group of major charitable donors, many of whom were also directors and governors of the charities. Following its foundation in 1756, for example, by a group of merchant, London merchants led by Jonas Hanway, the Marine Society promoted its cause through similar methods. Operating out of the heart of the city in Cornhill, it combined charity with political and economic interests, practicing charity and collecting funds in the name of commerce and country rather than in the name of humanity. Thus, its core values were closely in line with those of the founding hospital. The Marine Society's own incorporation in 1772 was commemorated in an allegorical print after a painting by Edward Edwards, published in 1774, where Charity presents a seated Britannia with a pair of ragged boys observed by a group of merchant governors. Later, Edwards produced a title cartouche also for James Rennell's map of Hindustan, done for the East India Company, which closely echoes the composition and format of his 1772 Marine Society engraving. Instead of Britannia being presented with boys by the figure of charity, she's presented with sacred Hindu texts, the Silver, silver Shastras by three Brahmins, observed by Indian merchants rather than English ones. There's a clear iconographic continuity then, I think, and linkage of charity, Britannia, and maritime commercial empire, centered around the iconography here of presentation, if you like, the idea of the presentation of children or, or gifting, which in turn goes back to the foundling hospital um, in something like how Moses, the, the extraordinary iconography of Moses brought before Pharaoh's daughter, and seems to be a, a theme particularly associated with the East India Company and its self-image in relation to the City of London. This culminated with the company brazenly commissioning Edward Penny, the Royal Academician at this stage, to paint a striking historical portrait of Robert Clive as the incarnation of charity. At the precise moment, yes, believe it or not, at the precise moment in 1771-2 when Clive was under parliamentary investigation for corruption. The painting, Lord Clive about to receive from the Nawab of Bengal a sum of money to be used for a charity known as the Clive Fund, shows Clive holding out the warrant for the charity to Najim ud Dawla, the eldest surviving son of Mir Jafar, the Indian general whom Clive had bribed to change sides decisively at the Battle of Plassey in 1757, and had then first installed and afterwards deposed as the Nawab of Bengal. And pointing out to the evidently shocked Nawab, the destitute and injured soldiers and their families who had served in India, and who thereby, so the pictorial rhetoric goes, deserve the Nawab's support through a sizable donation to the funds set up on their behalf. The Nawab, in turn, is touching the warrant with his left hand, indicating his full acquiescence in the project. Penny's composition is clearly indebted to Francis Heyman's earlier sympathetic portrayal of Clive at Vauxhall Gardens in the early 1760s, at the height of the Seven Years' War. Yet, although Natasha Eaton locates Penny's painting within the company's commissioning of portraits around the same time, once set against the backdrop of an artistic genealogy deriving, the commercial, deriving from the commercial centre of the city, it's apparent that it's also a variant on the iconography of charity associated with the founding hospital and the marine society. It bears a very marked resemblance to Edward's allegory for the latter's act of incorporation. And just to show the two together here. Although in Penny's painting, charity is personified in the figure of Clive himself, and it's thus Clive who makes the introduction between the destitute figures and the potential benefactor. There was therefore a distinctively self-referential iconography marking out the identity of the city of London and its citizens, as bound together through the common ties and privileges of commerce, to which Roman ceiling painting for East India House undoubtedly refers. And, it's this, and this identity was maintained with consistency and tenacity throughout the century. By way of co further confirmation, a precisely similar composition and a compositional iconographic format was pursued in John Bacon's relief sculpture for the Tympanum of East India House when it was expanded to Richard Jupp's design in the 1790s. 
Jupp was another city insider, having worked as surveyor to the company since 1768 and a designer of several of its London warehouses. Bacon's design for the tympanum adopted the same motif as Roma's ceiling painted inside, to which it makes obvious visual reference, of a seated Britannia again receiving the riches of the East from a kneeling personification of Asia. As the largest and most important maritime commercial organisation of the early modern world, in the words of one historian, the corporation that changed the world, the company, as a focus for the study of visual culture, necessarily forces a conceptualization of art and its histories in relation not just to commerce, but to the discourses and practices of the maritime sphere and its attendant colonial and imperial dimensions. In the case of the East India Company, this resulted in the careful negotiation of its relationship with India as both a trading ally, but also as colonial subject, India in the city and the city in India. That this relation is visualized in racialized terms is clear from Roma's painting, and Haymans and Pennies, with their shared emphasis on presentation and exchange across a divide identified through racial difference, which visualizes a non-Western world as both included and excluded, constantly on a threshold, and also the company as existing both within the metropolis and beyond it, and thus corresponding in different ways to Michel Foucault's definition of the other as that which for a given culture is at once interior and foreign. The East India Company's modernizing use of art in order to create its public image and its close relation to the philanthropic mission of the Foundling Hospital suggests that the narrative, narrative of 18th century British art should prioritize the pragmatic commercial concerns of mercantile companies and the city as underpinning, underpinning ideologies for the discourse of art and aesthetics. Starting that narrative with East India House, rather than following the conventional teleology that sees the foundling hospital leading to the establishment of the Royal Academy and so on, offers a different paradigm for understanding the development of British art, one that is necessarily inclusive of the maritime and imperial dimensions. Thinking through visual culture, therefore, in terms of the roots, circulations and currents of commercial maritime empire, also draws attention, just, kind of just coming to the conclusion now, also draws attention to ships as signifiers of early, of early modernity, which are included, of course, as the crucial component and complement to the scenes of exchange and presentation in Reisbrack, Romer's, Taylor's, and Jupp's depiction of commerce and identity. What Paul Gilroy has identified as a chronotope of modernity in relation to the Black Atlantic. For, of course, the outstanding commerce of this period which um, we're going to focus on over the course of the next two days, and one which, like the East India Company, has been elided in standard accounts of art history, was the economy of the slave trade. So in a discussion of J.M.W. Turner's painting The Slave Ship, Gilroy describes ships as the living means by which the points within the Atlantic world were joined, and I would argue further afield than the Atlantic world, the global world beyond Britain and the West. They were mobile elements that stood for the shifting spaces in between the fixed places they connected, Ships also refer us back to the Middle Passage, to the half-remembered micropolitics of the slave trade and its relationship both to both industrialization and modernization. As it were, getting on board promises a means to reconceptualize the orthodox relationship between modernity and what passes for its prehistory. It provides a different sense of where modernity might itself be thought to begin in the constitutive relationships with outsiders that both found and temper a self-conscious sense of Western civilization. A focus on the East India Company, therefore, similarly enables a reconsideration of the city and its commercial environment as providing an important alternative crucible for the development and character of British art and its own constitutive relationships with outsiders, and consequently provides an access to the larger globalizing and protein context of commercial maritime empire as a way of understanding where modernity might be thought to begin. Thank you very much.